Yield still rising. What does it mean? S&P 500 at all-time highs and non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Here with Tony Greer. Tony, welcome. Great to be here, Ash. How you doing? I'm doing well. Lots going on. Let's dive right in. Yeah, man. You know, like you said, like you started with, I, I really haven't taken my eye off the bond market since the daisy cutter two weeks ago. You know, that was a major move for me. Um, and, I'm, you know, I'm a big weekly close guy and daily close guy. And, you know, yields to me on a weekly closing basis. We've still got six weeks in a row of higher yields. So while the equity market wants to behave like, you know, they're really uh, the rate rise is done, the bond market is sitting there, you know, right on its lows with yields right on their highs saying the move is still in motion, in my opinion. And so that's a, that's important um, because as I see the translation of higher yields, I'm still looking for the commodity market to keep showing me signs of inflation coming. And I'm looking for the stock market to start changing its rotation quite a bit which I think we started to see um, and will continue to see in, in quite quite honest. I think technology is going to struggle. I've said that before. And I think we're going to see a robust natural resources tape in 2021 and beyond. I feel like we're yeah. setting the table for a sustained bull market in natural resources. Yeah, so much to unpack there. Let's stick with rates at the very beginning so people can understand what you're looking at. Are you looking at the tenure? Are you looking at the belly of the curve? Uh, how do you think about the relationship across the curve? Uh, and what are your thoughts more generally on where we're headed? Well, you know, Ash, I'm not a bond market expert, but I do have my way of following that market. And the way I follow it, you know, I'm looking at, you know, the flat price yields, right? Just yields in and of themselves. The charts have broken out from a downtrend into a consolidation and now have turned higher. So in my technical study, I haven't found them uh, reaching a resolution point just yet. So I'm still looking for yields themselves to find where their high is going to be. Now, I'm also going to have to watch the curve and break evens. And to me, nothing about the curve has shown that it's going to um, cave in and start um, flattening here. Rather, we remain in this bear steepening bond market action where we've got a bear move in treasuries with yields going higher and we've got the yield continuing to steepen. To me, that's critical. To me, that's the bond market pricing in more economic activity. And I think it's also, you know, when I look over at my inflation indicators, like the break even five year, man, if you take a step back from the break even five year chart and look at it on a 10 year basis, Ash, you know, the break evens have ripped through two and a half percent, which was a huge 10 year long top on the break evens. So now that they're breaking through those levels, it's telling me that the market is really anticipating more inflation than we think. So now that we're in breakout territory and break e five year break evens, you know I'm really nervous about the yield curve. Uh, excuse me, about yields continuing to rise, and I think that that's where we are right now. You know, the bond market may be taking a little bit of a break, but I still think there's another hellacious sell off coming that's going to push yields somewhere to find their peak, and then that's when I'll start to see if the equity rotation is firmly entrenched in this higher yield rotation, and we can proceed higher. It feels like we can proceed higher in stocks as long as the economy is there to back us up. Well, you know, Tony, that's exactly where I was about to go. Uh, pithy summary of what's happening in the bond market right now. What's it mean for equities and why? You know, equities, Ash, you know, they're they're at the stage where they're starting to put in some shock and awe performance. All mm -hmm. right. Like, let me let me read you just a couple of factoids. We've had seven consecutive positive sessions across materials, the Russell aerospace, the Dow Jones, Dow Jones transports, infrastructure, consumer discretionary, and real estate. Seven consecutive positive sessions. I mean, that is that is widespread participation of a bull market yeah. that I cannot possibly fade myself. Granted, there's going to be a point at which they'll pull back, but I want to buy the dip because of this continued performance. A lot of those sectors that I mentioned, breaking out to new highs, that's the type of market we're in where we want to be playing all these breakouts and not necessarily getting lured into shorting the tape at all. Then you look at the fact that this is only the seventh time since 1897 the Dow Jones set four consecutive record highs, which we just saw, gaining at least 50 basis points a day. Now, this happened seven times before in history. Obviously, the stock market has ended up much higher um, each time. But three of those happened before 1900. So even if you throw those out, 
only four times in the last century has the Dow Jones put in a four consecutive 50 basis point gains to new highs. To me, that is simply a market that is stretching its legs and finding the next level. And, you know, there's nothing about that type of action or data point that I can possibly fade, Ash. You know, just as we carved a new high in the S&P yesterday, I can still have my changing rotation in mind, but it still looks like it's landing our, uh, the, the net net of the rotation with energy and metals and natural resources rallying and maybe tech falling behind a bit, still netting out to a very positive S&P close on the majority of days. So, you know, that that's the dynamic that I'm looking at in the stock market right now. And it's one that's really hard to fade. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. There's some powerful forces that are driving equities higher. The tape doesn't lie. Uh, I'm curious, other than the bond market, what are some of the drivers that you're looking at for that? Is it stimulus? Uh, are there other factors that you see playing a significant role? Stimulus, absolutely, Ash. It's a great point, right? We have to talk about it because it's topical. The $1.9 trillion, the last stimulus package is you know on its way out to Americans. Hopefully, this one will make it to the right hands, to the people who need it. Um, but more importantly, I feel like we are, you know, we're, we're embarking on a new path in terms of stimulus. And I think that's why Janet Yellen is at the Treasury sort of, you know, commanding this operation. It seems like it's going to be become the norm. Now, you can tell me if I'm crazy and tell me if you think that that's wrong and I'll, I'm all ears. But I just I, I keep getting this feeling that like, you know, the next step of economic weakness is going to be like, oh, OK, are we getting a stimulus check for this, too? And I, I just feel like that if that's the mode that we're heading into, if I'm if I'm perceiving it right as we move into the Biden admin, then right. you know, we're in for three or four years of this. And that's going to give us a nice runway in equities, because I just think the bigger the Fed balance sheet gets the more inflationary scenario we're going to be living through. And no matter what, there is no alternative other than the stock market, really. I mean, other than Bitcoin and, and the, the new bull markets that have been created mm -hmm. with all the liquidity. But yeah. I think that the institutional investor is going to remain pretty heavily, squarely placed in the stock market. And I think that's still the right place to be, quite honestly. Yeah, on digital assets, of which more later. But to stick to your point right now, yeah, I mean, there's certainly been talk uh, about uh, Janet Yellen coming into the Secretary of Treasury role. Uh, there's been speculation, at least, about this is someone who can coordinate very well, obviously, with Jay Powell at the Fed. There's no one who knows uh, that role better than Janet Yellen, obviously, having served uh, for many years as, uh, as as chair. And so there is that question about what is that, you know, what is that sort of for token for the economy? Is this something that is going to continue to roll on? Look, there's been no doubt about it. We've been in a terrible situation in this country now for the last 13 months economically because of this terrible pandemic. Uh, you've had small businesses, especially mom and pop shops, people who physically have to go in uh, to factories, people who have to go in uh, waiting tables and restaurants have just gotten absolutely whacked. Uh, so there's no question that there's a need to do something. But the question that you pose, Tony, I think is a really important and powerful one. Does this just become a permanent part of the way the economy functions? Is there no way to kind of take away the punch bowl? Does the punch bowl become like, I don't know, like a like a punch tap? It's like a keg. It just constantly gets refilled uh, by the barbacks underneath, and they just keep screwing them on as we go. And what does that mean? What does that mean for price discovery? What does that mean for the price of credit? What does that mean for the ability of markets to discount risk? What does that mean for our free market economy? I don't have any answers to those questions. <laughs> Oh, man, those are big questions. But I like the analogy very much because it does feel like an equity keg party that's going on out there right now. You know, it's it's different, um, different manufacturing sectors carving new highs, um, you know, technology lagging behind. But you still got the participation of semiconductors largely on those cyclical days. So it's um, it's a difficult tape to fade. It like if I had to pick my spots, Ash, you know, I still think that there will be a rotation out of large cap equities just because we spent the last 10 months buying them every day. Um, so the rotation is definitely due for a change as we posture toward a more inflationary type of um, platform in the U.S., if that's fair to say. So, you know, while the changes happen, I mean, the S&P just continues to grind new highs. We're seeing new highs in some other markets around the world. You know, the, the participation is, has been, you know, widespread on most days. Global equities are going higher. So if that's if that's a, that's a bull market, we're going to continue to play the breakouts in until we see something change. 
And like I said, I feel like we could be on the verge of a bond market change. But as long as there's no dislocation and the bond market move to higher yields is orderly, the, as the S&P is telling us it can handle that as well. So that that to me is you know an even stronger sign, and then you've got these dynamics underneath Ash, you know where, you know the the weak dollar was causing really really strong commodity performance, and then for the last couple of weeks we've seen a stronger dollar, yet commodities continue to perform, right? So that's a tell that I can't take my eye off of as a commodity trader. You know I rode the commodity bull market with the whole move lower in the dollar since March. And now we've seen the dollar level off a little bit, but we've still got copper reaching towards the highs. We just saw aluminum carve a new high in the last couple of days. Precious metal, uh, excuse me, platinum group metals, platinum and palladium continue to trade higher like base metals. And right here, we've got the gold and silver markets sort of leveling off into a pullback zone that I feel like is completely safe to buy. And you know everything is starting to tell the story of an inflationary type of market. And so I think you have to be positioned right. for that. And I think you have to be long hard assets for it. And so it's a lot, it's a lot of more of the same, Ash. But you know, the thing that we're stepping into now is that, you know, a lot of these commodity houses are doing their research. You've got Goldman Sachs coming out and making a comment on copper saying that this is the largest deficit in copper that we've seen in 10 years. Copper deficits into a reopening of an economy with the Federal Reserve stepping on the gas, I mean, the sky's the limit for metals prices right now, right? They, they've been outperforming technology. I think they're going to spend the rest of the year outperforming technology. And when we start to run into structural deficits, we'll probably be in a period where commodities trade straight up for weeks and weeks at a time. So I think that that's what the bond market is maybe foretelling with yields rising. I think it's finally acknowledging this serious move in crude oil, gasoline, copper, aluminum. And as this pans out, all we're going to have is the nonlinear path higher, I think, for stocks and commodities and the bond market giving us a read on how much it can handle, if that's yeah. fair to say. Yeah, Tony, I'm curious. I didn't read the Goldman report. Is there any uh, speculation about where the demand is coming from? Is it domestic? Is it international? Is it coming from China? Uh, or is it broad based? You know, their, their bullish story is really a supply side story in, in copper, right? I think that they're. Um, I think that the demand side they've spoken about as being just sort of, you know, the U.S. coming out of the lockdown, um, you know, being a nonlinear demand path in terms of how how much copper we consume. But that that uh, from the from the reports, uh, excuse me, from the portions of the report that I got to read and see, um, it was really talking about, you know, peak copper supply showing up in 2023, 2024 and then running a larger deficit after that. So, you know, I think that the, the demand continues to come from China, from India, and, you know, with the U.S. and European recovery around the corner, I think we'll be back at probably, you know, peak level of global copper demand before we know it, Ash, if that's fair to, to stipulate. And also, I should add, um, it's we're doing this uh, now around uh, 245, uh, 250 as we come in here. I just noticed that uh, the, uh, the VIX just dropped below 20, uh, which is at or near uh, the lows of the post-pandemic period. We got up to around, I think, 85 or so uh, at, during the worst of it uh, about uh, about a year ago, almost to the day, uh, and now we're below 20. Yeah, the VIX, the VIX seems to um, hold up, let's say, Ash, in, in this period of, of, you know, I guess we, we, we've, volatility has shrunk as we've come out of the lockdown, but the volatility market to me is still building in a premium. The volatility markets still aren't really dipping into the teens for very long. They really aren't falling asleep in a 15 to 20 range. They're kind of just dipping down here. And next thing you know, something happens where the stocks back off and you see a rising VIX again. So I'm, I would be more, you know, when the VIX settles in and goes to sleep, I would be more looking for the right time to buy a little bit of protection maybe. You know, I'm still a bull market trader, so I'm, I'm trying not to let the VIX scare me right now. But um, I, I do want to respect the fact that if it sort of settles into the teens at a really cheap price, that's the point maybe that it makes sense to buy a little bit of S&P protection. But other than that, we want to be eyes forward on the bull market. Yeah. Tony, let me run something by you. This morning, I was looking at the uh, February retail sales report, uh, negative print minus 3.0 on, uh, on last month. Uh, that's from a previous 5.3% positive uh, and then revised up to 76 
positive uh, for January. And I'm reading this and I'm going, what, what the heck am I reading here? Does this even matter? Is this relevant to anything? Am I just reading like, you know, just reading basically like the storm data? I mean, with swings like that, how much significance does a data point like that have? That's such a good point, Ash, because I often feel like the markets are doing what they're going to do anyway. Right. And the data, the data is a little bit of inconveniences along the way. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like big picture, the, the bond market and the equity markets are looking toward a reopening. They're looking toward, you know, inflationary, more economic activity. If last month's retail data didn't agree, then, you know, I don't know what I don't even know what to say coming out of the pandemic. But I feel like broadly speaking, the market is telling us a coherent story right. of economic growth coming our way. Yeah, look, data matters in the long term, but there are fluctuations month to month, especially when you have seasonal uh, impacts and especially when you have these months that are generally lower uh, because of seasonality. Uh, but to your to your point, I think that's exactly right. It kind of does feel like markets are going to do what they're going to do, uh, and they're just looking for justification in the data to do it rather than direction from the data. Yeah, and at the same time, like, you know, if you step back as a human being and you saw, you know, a lot of economic weakness and you saw some people, you know, spend money anyway, spend some stimulus checks over the holidays and then really tighten up the belt after that. Right. As a narrative, that would make sense to me. That would be that would make total sense to me where, you know, maybe February and, and January are your smallest months of retail spending of the year. Right. You know, especially in months 11, 12 of a lockdown. Right. right. We should we should consider that. So that's just, you know, how the data is going to roll. But the market's the last sale is what we're we're concerned about. Yeah, exactly. Well said. So, Tony, I know we talked a little bit uh, off camera about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, <sighs> red hot topic. What are your thoughts? I mean, it feels good to be excited about the blockchain. You know, like I, I, I really I'm not into chasing crypto. And I'm while I'm watching it and I'm kind of rooting for its adoption, it's not it's not falling in my lap to trade. I haven't really had a leg up on trading crypto. But when you see the NFT space come out, and as a collector, as you guys know, I mean, you see my pictures all over the wall, I get excited about having a real, more trustworthy authentication system. And to right. me, that that builds real value. You know, if I could really prove that Derek Jeter signed the pictures that are on my wall, right. I would feel a lot better about calling them valuable or perceiving them as valuable myself. Right. You know, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, whether we can get some of this physical collectible stuff onto the blockchain, onto, you know, to become non-fungible tokens. But if we don't, and the non-fungible tokens remain their own electronic type of market and electronic type of art, or however it, it, it goes, I'm excited about it because I think it's like, you know, it's going to be looked at as another asset class yeah. Uh, clearly, clearly commanding sixty nine million dollars at yeah. you know the Sotheby's auction for Beeple's five thousand days, that speaks for itself, Ash. Right? If we're going to say yeah. point at la if we're going to be last sale bros about it, then we can certainly point at the last sale at seventy million and say, bro, NFTs. I mean, it's not fake, right? There's there's something to it. And at this point, not owning any, I feel short NFTs and, and I can't stand that right now. You know, so right. my first idea is to, you know, while this could be a bubble phenomenon, my first idea is to still find an NFT that I'm comfortable paying the price for and start by owning that, you know, and then maybe you pick something in, uh, from the right artist or from the from the right uh, category and maybe you have something valuable one day. But this is going to be another case of beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Right. And right now, we've got a lot of crypto millionaires and maybe billionaires running around out there with a lot of money and a lot of Ethereum to spend. So, you know, this market may be trading away from me for a while, but we'll see, man. It's just an interesting, you know, I, I love the art market. I love auctions. And I am thrilled that we've got an actual authentication system that I would certainly trust, let's say, more than a Steiner Sports um, document that was handwritten on the back and says that this is real. Yeah, absolutely. Look, to your point about prices and the potential to be in a bubble, uh, you know, will the next trade on that piece be $69 million, $169 million, or $12 million? I have the faintest idea. But right. your point is an incredibly important one, which is we're seeing something different here. We're seeing the ability to authenticate digital scarcity in a decentralized way, in a way that can be viewed transparently by everyone who has access to the blockchain, which is basically everybody who's got a phone. 
That is a major shift in the way that we think about digital assets, digital scarcity, and a whole lot of other things in commerce as well. Totally. Totally. You know, we're going to face, you know, that market is obviously going to face its counterfeits and its scammers and it's everything, but I'm going to hold it as a value of, you know, th things with a physical certificate are going to be valued down here to me. Things with a blockchain certificate of authenticity are going to be valued a little bit higher to me. So, you know, right. that, that I think will, will sort, its out, sort itself out um, within the real collectors and within the real people that are influential in this space. Um, but but still, like like you said, the most important thing is that we've got a new measure of value and an actual sort of quantification of it. Obviously, if this um, NFTs are going to train from tra trade from person to person, we're going to have an audit trail built in. Right. We're going to have an authentic audit trail. We're going to have a history of its market of, of what it's worth. And to me, that's you know that just speaks to the things that you and I are all about as traders, right? We're trying to figure out what's valuable in the world. We would love some transparency as to how we can look at that value trade. And I just feel like this is a sort of more transparent art and memorabilia market than the one that we've been experiencing our, our whole lives. Like, right? Like yeah. there may be the whole list of available NFTs on the globe and what they trade at, at, at any random time or what their last sale was at any given point. And I think that'll be exciting to have around and, and, and a part of our market vernacular and something part of our society. I think it's a cool, cool one of the cool digital enhancements that, that technology offers rather than sort of detractions from your life. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly right. And and again, I think it's so early in this space. We're just at the beginning, just beginning to understand what these potential use cases is. Let me throw something out for NFTs that I think is fascinating. So what an NFT is, a non-fungible token, what makes that different from Bitcoin or Ethereum is that it's a token that is unique. It's a, a token of one. So every token is different. Typically, uh, dollars, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're fungible. If I have a $100 bill and you have a $100 bill, we can swap them, doesn't matter to us, right? The idea that you can basically have a unique stamp on something that can be authenticated by the network, by anyone who has access to a phone or a computer, game changer. But here's a use case that I'm absolutely fascinated by. Let's stick with sports for a minute, right? Everybody who's ever gone up to Yankee Stadium to buy a ticket when you didn't have one, there's a guy who's got a bunch of tickets in his hand. You give him a hundred bucks or whatever. He gives you the ticket. You walk in and the minute you're about to walk through that gate, when you hand the guy your ticket, your heart skips a beat because you don't know whether or not you've just bought a ticket that's real or fake and obviously, as the amounts of money go up, you become less and less willing to do it. Maybe you're willing to go and buy a bleacher seat, but you're not willing uh, to go and buy a you know, third row seat at uh, for fish at the garden, right? Here's what's amazing about NFTs, the thing that I find absolutely fascinating. You can have digital distributed trust on chain. And what that means is if it's like seven o'clock at night and you decide you want to go and catch an Islanders game, the guy who's selling you the tickets, you can verify whether or not the ticket is legitimate. That is a game changer. And here's the other point that I think is absolutely fascinating. You can structure the smart contracts behind the NFTs so that the person who originated the ticket can get paid. That is an absolute game changer. So that means your favorite band can make money every time a ticket changes hands. It creates an active secondary market in a way that's massively liquid, in a way that is legitimate, in a way that the content creators continue to get paid. This is something we've never seen before in history. There's never been a technology that allowed you to transfer in a decentralized way a claim on a seat uh, or entrance to a gate in a way that the people who created the content, the people who actually deserve, the, the, who are taking the risk, who are putting on the show, who are producing the baseball game, who are playing on the field can get compensated. That's absolutely amazing. Really is, man. You just blew my mind with that whole concert relation thing there. I mean, every ticket is just going to be an NFT or a form of one going forward at some point, right? An absolutely non-corruptible proof right. on your phone that this is not this belongs to you. This is the only way to get into the venue. And I think there's a beautiful thing in that, right? In yeah. the security, in knowing, in the value. I mean, that this is this is value creation out of thin air, right? From technology. Right. And so this this is the kind of stuff that we can embrace. Um, it relates to all the markets and the arts and the music that we love. Right. So it probably enhances them. It makes life better for the artist. To share a story, I have a friend that's a great, great artist named Peter Strid. 
he put his first work of art into an NFT, posted it up on Rarible, and there's now a bidding war going on for his piece of Pink Panther art where it's trading, you know, the, the bid, the best bid right now is like ten or twelve thousand dollars. Now, with there was no NFT market, there's nobody bidding ten thousand dollars for my friend's piece of art. And this is a material payday for him, right? This is a guy right. that's, you know, waiting for his next sale to see what his income is going to be. So I think it's really cool that somebody can look, that an artist can now look at it and say, well, I've got this piece of art right now that's bid this on online on this auction, and I'm going to try to sell this one that might be worth this. So now they can start putting a value that's a little bit more accurate on their portfolio. And, you know, I, I just feel like the sky is the limit with the way this can go. But really, Ash, I'm more interested in you know the fact that these collectibles and getting physical collectibles potentially onto the blockchain and authenticated officially. Um, either way, I think that there's a budding market for both you know new NFP NFT formats and getting old collectibles onto an NFT format. So this is something yeah. that I think is new and gonna be with us for a long time. Yeah, collectibles are absolutely fascinating. I did an interview with Kevin Chow uh, from Rally um, about a week ago, and I believe it's going to be airing in the next couple of weeks here uh, on Real Vintage. And it's absolutely fascinating. Again, not an endorsement of a particular platform or a company, uh, but the ideas that Kevin was talking about, absolutely fascinating. I'll give you one. Let's say you decide uh, to spin up a Tony Greer podcast, right? And you have a podcast and your fans can go and they can tip you, they can subscribe, you can do all of this uh, interchange of value between you. Here's what I didn't know and I think is absolutely fascinating. People can come and say, Tony, I'm, a, I'm an audio editor. I want to work for you. I want to do some work on this. I absolutely love it. You can then pay them in your native token. So effectively, what you're creating is an entire value ecosystem, a digital value ecosystem around the content that you own. It's absolutely fascinating. Again, extremely early. We don't know how it's going to shake out. But I have very little doubt that there are a lot of smart men and women in their 20s out there who are going, this is cool tech. I want to be involved in it. I want to be building the next decentralized version of my business in this format. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, if, if if I didn't have the morning navigator to write every day, I might leave what I was doing now and dive into the NFP NFT market. I, I really think that it's very timely and it's a little bit bubbly, but it's seems like the beginning of a storyline and not the end. You know, I, I just think it's going to start helping artists and consumers in a way that they're both going to appreciate. And we haven't even written the story for these yet. And it's something that I'm wildly interested in. I think it's a really, really young and budding industry. Yeah. Seems like the beginning of the storyline and not the end is about the best summation I could come up with from my feelings. About it. So it just seems like it's only going to grow. Uh, so Tony, as we come closer to the end here, final thoughts uh, as you look out for the rest of the week. Sure, Ash. Um, you know, it, it's it's figuring out how to get a hold of the natural resource market by the tail and, and to be confident that you've got it wrapped up all the right ways right now heading forward. Um, you know, this 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 breakout in the five year break even to me is an unadulterated inflation five alarm fire going on right now. Right. The Federal Reserve is trying to downplay it. The media is downplaying it. But nobody really wants to talk about how the paradigm has changed with the Fed, Fed's balance sheet just expanding at a enormous rate right now. So I feel like that's still the big story sticking in my head. The story in my head is I should have at least a handle on grains, metals, oil, and maybe the shippers or transports, another you know corollary to the to the natural resources trade. But I think that these are the sectors that are really going to be outperforming technology by wide margins this year. And I think that once people start seeing their underperformance in technology, that will lead to more selling of technology and more buying of the natural resources. I don't think the world is full on positioned yet in natural resources or close. So that that's the trade that I'm really hunting down with reckless abandon over the next several months. Ash. Yeah. NFTs may be the future. Bond market is the present. Bond market, we can't take our eye off for five seconds, right? The NFTs, you and I can sit and talk about for 12 hours if we felt like for sure. Right. And I would be glad to. I would be glad to. It's stimulating conversation. Yeah, it's the difference between playing offense and playing defense. Yeah, it's a good point. That's a good point. So, you know, with these with structural deficits in mind in the commodity market, with yields rising in mind, with break evens rising in mind, to me, 
this is a hard re resource, uh, hard asset resource grab for the rest of the year, man. We'll see if um, we'll, we'll see if it lasts this way. But this is the way this year is shaping up for me. Clear as day. Yeah, very well said, Tony. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ash. That was fun.